Okay, let's talk about applied exercise science in the training of the standard bread, in the training of the 148 standard bread. Exercise that we do with standard breads right now, which is basically a, a Stanley Dancer chart number 19, three times a mile, anywhere between a half an hour and 45 minutes in between. Two thirty five, two twenty five, two fifteen, let's say. And uh, we'll do this maybe twice a week. So you get six training miles a week. And I'm not going to talk about the background mileage and all this. We understand, everybody understands that uh, the horse needs to be, quote, legged up. And basically, that's a, a matter of mileage. We're kind of shorting our horses these days. They're going shorter and shorter jogs every day. Uh, some people claim that this is because of economics. Um, I don't think it's because of economics. Uh, I think that uh, we're getting tired of uh, working with horses. But let's look at that chart number 19, that step-by-step -step, uh, progression from three times a mile <clears throat> with 45-minute rest periods down to 215, maybe down below that, maybe down to 208, somewhere near qualifying time with that third mile of the six miles a week. And usually your fast mile, fast mile for the week is on the second day, maybe Monday and Thursday you're doing training, and uh, on Thursday uh, the fastest mile occurs. Let's let's say let's just assume that's a 210. And uh, on the day that you do that 210, you might do a 220 before that mile and a 230 before that mile. And as far as the exercise is concerned one of those miles is close to being useful in terms of specificity of exercise for a race. The other five miles are uh, training the horse away from uh, the mile that we're looking for, that 148 or the 152, the 155, the 158, whatever the mile we're going toward. Uh, five of the miles that we do each week are too slow to have any effect on whether or not the animal can uh, uh, perform in our target race time. That's unfortunate uh, uh, because we are going to ask the horse to perform in our target race time uh, at, some, at some point down the line, and more than likely we're going to kind of race that horse into shape. The only real training the horse, once the horse start qualifies, and starts uh, racing, then the only fast mile he's going to do is his race mile, uh, hopefully once a week. Uh, of course, we're getting afraid of once a week racing. We're getting afraid of heat racing. We're getting afraid of anything that demands a fit athlete. Uh, still, maybe once a week the horse is going to get race-specific training, and it's going to be in a race. Now the trouble with uh, doing race-specific training in a race is that it's not a controlled situation. You're zigging and zagging, going outside, going inside, trying to find a hole, trying to find a place to, uh, to race the horse in a crowd of other animals. Uh, and if you're simultaneously asking for too much in a dangerous situation, uh, the likelihood of injury uh, is increased dramatically. Uh, it can be mental injury as well as physical injury. So uh, right now, five of the six miles that we do each week are not appropriate, and the six miles not that hot. I mean, if you're going to race in 158 and you're training in 210, uh, you're not preparing a horse for 158, not remotely, even though the horse may deliver a 158 or may deliver a 156 eventually uh, in the season. Uh, if he does, it's going to be because something else has trained him to that point, and it's generally the, the racing that he, that he goes through. And then we train him to finish. We shoot that last quarter mile real fast, and we think we've, we've done something for the horse. But 
really what we have not done is taught the horse to sustain high rates of speed for a two minute period of time. Uh, and that's the problem. That's the target. That's what we have to get done. Uh, if we don't do it, then the horse will do it by himself, maybe. Uh, and maybe he'll get uh, a cripple on, in the, on the way to that. Maybe his lungs will explode and he'll start to bleed. Maybe his knees will start to chip. Uh, maybe his feet will wobble the wrong way and hit the ground and blow suspensory. Now you've uh, heard me talk about uh, interval training and I'm going to go over that uh, process uh, again in a more detailed way. Interval training is not lots of miles. Uh, interval training is talks specifically about doing race-specific exercise in quantities enough to make a difference, to actually get a conditioning effect. And if I had a standard bred, let's say, that was uh, capable, fully capable right now of 202, and I wanted the horse to go in two minutes as quickly as possible, uh, if I went after them with miles, single miles, or uh, the three times a miles with 45 minute rest periods in between uh, that we think of as conventional training, um, if I want him to go in two minutes, I can train him in 205 like we would do normally and maybe get a two minute race mile, or I could race him. Uh, against two-minute horses and suck them along and maybe uh, he'd get a 201 to start with and then maybe a, a two-minute race later on. But I'm risking passing, crossing that fatigue threshold uh, and injuring him when I do that. Uh, that's not the way to get the speed that we're looking for, the neuromuscular coordination, the quickness, the alacrity, the ability to move those legs, fire all those muscle cells at once, uh, to get that uh, two-minute speed from him. Even though he can hit a 30-second quarter every day of the week, uh, again, we're talking about sustained speed. He has to be able to make the speed, and then he has to be able to tolerate the results of making that speed, which is lactic acid and muscle fuel depletion. So what we need is a, is a quantity of exercise, as large as we can uh, make that quantity, um, directed specifically at the problems and the physiology that he will encounter in that race. And that means more miles at racing speed or very close to racing speed. Now, if you took the same horse out that you've been doing 220, 210, two minutes with, or 225, 215, 205 with, and try to do two minutes, two minutes, two minutes with him, uh, you'd kill him. Uh, you'd certainly cripple him, and uh, he wouldn't be coming back for a while. Can't do it that way. You can keep trying to bump him against that two-minute barrier, and maybe, maybe not, he'll make it through that barrier and go on down. Uh, again, uh, every time you ask him for more than he can do, uh, you're asking him to get hurt. So how the hell do you get a two-minute mile from a 202 horse safely, preserving his racing ability and his racing career while enhancing his performance? Uh, one way is to... It, if we know that this horse can probably do a, a one-minute half mile with his eyes closed. Uh, he's already demonstrated in a 202 mile, he's already probably shown us 30 second quarters at the tail end of it and this kind of thing. Uh, very likely he can do a half mile in a minute and that's two minute speed. Uh, however, it's not a mile at two minutes. Uh, and that's that's the second half of the equation. The speed comes first, or the speed is the first component we're looking for, and sustainable speed is the second. If I do, let's say, a half mile in 108, and then 
I rest a short period of time. In other words, at 108, I'm going to bump that lactic acid up just a little bit. It's going to talk to the horse. It's going to fill his blood vessels with blood. It's going to pump his muscles up. It's going to uh, loosen and heat up his body so that he's flexible. And uh, uh, automatically from that 108, uh, his whole body is going to say to him, hey, look, I can do a 105 uh, right now. And uh, within five minutes of that uh, 108 heat, if I turn him again and roll him, uh, without me asking at all, he's going to deliver a 105, just, just for the pure pleasure of it. He's going to enjoy that. Now, 105 tickles a little bit deeper into that uh, lactic acid uh, pileup, and that five-minute rest period, uh, it, it, the, the lactic acid that's there would get out to the bloodstream from the muscle cells in that five-minute period of time, but it would not go away. It would be out there floating around. And then the second heat throws a little bit more lactic acid onto the, onto the fire. Now, after he did that second 105 uh, half mile, it's likely after this five minute uh, uh, rest period where he walks and jogs up and walks and jogs up and walks. Uh, basically, again, we're contracting muscle cells when we do that and we're flushing lactic acid into the bloodstream out of the muscles so that they are, again, viable for more work. Um, he could probably do a, a 103 half mile um, and we can roll him at that at the, we could just let him go and see what he what he'll do and it's probably from my experience uh, dealing having dealt with about a hundred maybe 120 horses that have standard breads that have gone through this kind of a process that's likely is a the third heat starting with 108 it's probably going to go in 102 103 and that my, that half mile is going to throw a significant load of lactic acid in. He's going to, uh, uh, his muscle cells will know that they have worked. And not only that, but we're starting to dig into uh, secondary echelons of muscle troops. Uh, f some of the first muscle cells that we used when we did that 108 have uh, used their fuel. They're out of gas. And they'll pass the job on to uh, other muscle cells, or those other, mus other muscle cells will be recruited once the body realizes that the first echelon is exhausted. Uh, so we're digging deeper into the muscles now. Uh, we're asking for faster and faster speed, and uh, what that means in terms of what the muscle cells do uh, is that uh, more muscle cells are firing at one time. In other words, if I had two weights on a table in front of me and they both looked the same and the first one I picked up weighed 25 pounds and I curled it, my muscles would be used to that. I would have recruited, uh, who knows, half a million muscle cells to do that job. Uh, if it was a 50 pound weight over there, uh, I would have to recruit maybe a, a million muscle cells to do the same job, okay, to lift it from here to there. Now, if I had a, uh, a weight over here that looked like the 50-pound weight, but it really was plastic or styrofoam, and it weighed two ounces, and I grabbed it and lifted it, the million muscle cells would fire because my brain is saying, hey, here's a million muscle cell job, but really it's, it's two ounces, and so I'd hit myself in the head with it. Uh, in other words... Uh, you can't fire muscle cells a little bit or a lot. You're basically recruiting muscle cells in quantity, and the more muscle cells you recruit in quantity uh, per stride or per, per firing all at once, uh, the more power you deliver. Okay? And speed, basically, is a combination of power, uh, that's how many muscle cells are fighting, and rate of turnover of the limb, or scientifically, neuromuscular coordination. Okay, in other words, those wires, uh, are they hooked up and do they have neurotransmitters at the end of them that are going to deliver the signal quickly to lots and lots of muscle cells? If so, uh, between that and the number of muscle cells we're recruiting and that are fueled and ready to go, uh, we've got power. And if they're fueled and ready to go, we've got sustainable power at least until lactic acid buildup stops us.
so we're into our third half mile. And that's what's happening. We're recruiting more and more cells and recruiting uh, cells that haven't been used yet because the firepower hasn't been demanded and there were other muscle cells up there available. So they were recruited first. They were the ones that were wired the best. Uh, now, though, we're digging down deeper into the muscles that are throwing the horse forward and recruiting more that uh, haven't been used yet. The faster we go, the, the more fast twitch muscle cells are being recruited and the less slow twitch muscle cells are being recruited. Uh, in fact, probably the 108 uh, mile didn't recruit too many uh, slow twitch muscle cells, but still, the percentage of fast twitch muscle cells goes up uh, with speed. So we're starting to recruit, recruit more and more of the right kind of muscle cell to do the job. Now we give another five minute rest and we go for the fourth half mile. Okay. Meanwhile, our lactic acid is, is going up and leveling off and going up and leveling off and going up and leveling off. And we hit that fourth half mile, and it might go in 101 or it might go in a minute, depending on how the horse feels that day. And uh, again, we're letting the horse do uh, uh, without begging him, chirping him, but not begging him, not hitting him for sure. We're letting him roll into what he wants to do. And typically in a workout out like this, uh, the horse will deliver a minute or a 101 half mile on that fourth half. All right, now we're getting into some real lactate buildup. We're getting into some real muscle fuel depletion in the muscles. Uh, we, at this point, we're going to see some kind of a rebound effect uh, four to five days from now. Uh, we are conditioning the horse very well. Uh, still, uh, in a race, the horse is going to see gigantic lactic acid numbers. It's going to see 40 millimoles per liter. We might be around 10 millimoles per liter right now with this uh, fourth, fourth half mile, although the lactic acid is starting to climb very rapidly, uh, heat by heat. So we're in, we're in a, a period here where it starts to get uh, uh, on the edge of crossing the fatigue threshold. In other words, that fifth and sixth half mile that we uh, have programmed for this horse uh, may or may not be doable depending on uh, how the horse uh, likes this fourth half mile and then how he goes into the fifth half mile. Let's just assume that in this workout we just uh, got ourselves uh, a one minute half mile. And we rest him for five minutes. He's kind of puffing, and uh, he's certainly lathering up or sweating a little bit. Uh, but typically, after about two minutes of walking, he wants to jog up. He wants to move. Uh, and he may still be blowing some, uh, but he does want to move. Now, let's talk about blowing for a minute. <clears throat> we all tend to think of uh, blowing as uh, paying back an oxygen debt. Okay, we're saying, wow, I really gutted him. I sucked him down, and now he's breathing real hard to pay back all that oxygen that he uh, was short uh, during this work. Really, when you're doing <clears throat> high-speed exercise, the blowing is more to blow off heat than it is to repay oxygen. So he's not starving for breath uh, as much as he is blowing off heat. The horses uh, will blow different from human beings. Human beings will breathe and then within five minutes after a, a, a one minute burst of exercise uh, we'll be all paid back and we won't be breathing hard. The horse will still be breathing hard because he's that's his heat loss mechanism. He, he's kind of like a dog in that way. Dogs pant. Horses tend to blow off heat through their uh, lungs too. They get very high body temperatures during high-speed workouts. We've measured temperatures at uh, core temperatures at uh, 108, 108 and a half degrees uh, in these horses. Uh, and it doesn't do anything to them. Uh, they recover fine and, and are over it uh, very quickly. So he'll be blowing. Uh, we know that our lactic acid is starting to climb, and if it's at 10 now or 12 millimoles per liter, the next heat will probably bring it to up around 20. I mean, it's going up uh, quickly. Still, uh, we, we do what the horse is fully capable of doing, and if he's fully capable of doing another half mile, and that half mile goes in one minute, 
uh, we're real pleased. And in fact, uh, a horse that goes 108, 105, 102, 100, 100 can still deliver another half mile, a sixth half mile. How do I know this? Well, again, hundreds of horses uh, have been through this, more than a hundred that I've personally taken through this process. And uh, I've heard some horses uh, in the middle of this, this kind of a workout. And when you hurt a horse, it's when you get the horse coming back to you and you still go on with the program. In other words, uh, programs are great uh, until the horse says no or until something about the environment of the horse says no. And then you better stop. You better stop immediately. If you don't stop, uh, you'll hurt your horse. So let's say that this uh, fifth half mile, instead of going in one minute, he backs up a little bit and gives me a 102. The workout's over, okay? What we want to see is that kind of a curve in the workout. We want to dig and dig and dig. We're going deeper into those muscle cells, recruiting more and more millions of muscle cells as the first echelon troops are becoming exhausted. Uh, we want to dig as deep as we can, but when we are approaching that fatigue threshold, we want to call it a day, okay? And a horse that falls off two seconds uh, from half mile to half mile or more uh, is telling us that uh, the lactic acid is starting to paralyze or starting to slow down the contractile times of his muscle cells. And one more heat might go in 108, but it might also result in a, in a bowed tendon. We don't want to see a 108 final heat. Uh, we want to see all. We want to see a nice little tip at the end of the curve. That tells us we got to the bottom of the horse, and uh, he delivered a workout that he was fully capable of. Now, so what we've done here is all of our work. This three miles, if we're doing six halves, this three miles of work is all concentrated down at racing speeds or near racing speeds, and a couple of the halves are faster than this horse typically does, delivers uh, in a race. We've got two one-minute uh, halves on a, on a two-minute horse. Now, I can tell you for sure that the results of a workout like that on a 202 horse, the results of a work at, workout like that is a two-minute horse. If you can, in five halves, without the fifth half going up in the sky someplace, having to stop in the middle of it or something like that, if you get a fa five halves and a workout done and two of them are in a minute, you have uh, a horse that can deliver a two-minute mile with its eyes closed. Uh, that's the truth. I, I know that to be for sure. Um, a pair of 59s in a five-half workout uh, is a 158 horse. A pair of 58s is a 156 horse. Uh, automatically, these horses are fully capable, no matter what the traffic is in the, uh, in the race, these horses are built to deliver the best two halves that you can get out of five. And if you get a, a 101 and a 102, as your best two half miles, you've got a 203 horse and you do not and cannot or should not try to deliver uh, a two minute mile. You don't have it. You haven't built the horse that can deliver a two minute mile. Now that's one of the big differences between this concept of interval training and the concept of conventional training. You train down a 205 and you may get a 158. Uh, uh, that's because you don't know. Uh, when, you, when you're training, the, the interval training process, you do know precisely what you've got, and you don't have anything other than what the horse tells you he can deliver. So uh, if you get a minute and a minute and expect to see a 158 out of the horse, you're crazy. It's not going to happen. If you get a, a 102 and a 101, you've got a 203 horse. If you get a, a 103 and a 104 and you think you're really doing something, hey, it's a, it's a 207 racehorse. That's what you're training for. That's what you're going to get. Uh, interval training is extremely effective. Uh, it delivers precisely what you see in the training sessions. It delivers nothing other than that. Now, of course, we, we don't go to half miles from miles. Uh, in fact, the whole process starts with triple headers. Uh, you're used to doing double headers once in a while. 
A triple header is a 235, 225, uh, 215 with 10 minutes resting, and that's active rest. He walks and he trots and he walks and he trots and he goes around the wrong way until 10 minutes precisely is up. He turns and rolls the next mile. Uh, so there's 10-minute rest periods between the three miles. Now, we're not doing race-specific exercise at that point. We're in the middle of that big funnel I was talking to you on the last tape. We're going uh, from long and slow to shorter and faster, and we're going through three times a mile. The next step we'll be going through to get closer and closer. With three times a mile, we're getting cardiovascular stuff done. We're building the plumbing. We're building the capillaries. We're uh, also increasing the thickness of the cartilage and toughening up all the uh, collagen-based uh, tissues in the horse's body. That's all going on from day one till race day and after race day if we don't do something stupid. If there's no surprises, even the races will help uh, thicken that cartilage and toughen those bones and tendons and ligaments. <clears throat> so in the three times a mile, uh, we're into a, a cardiovascular stage of exercise, and we'll take that three times a mile down to 215, maybe 210. Um, I took a trip to Australia, and I met a, a fellow over there named John McMullen. And John McMullen was using... Uh, an interval training process that was just uh, three times a mile. Now, uh, well, one thing to know about Australia is they race a mile and a half over there. The best mile is their official time. Somewhere in there is going to be a mile that they clock, uh, and it's usually the last the last mile. But um, So they race a mile and a half, and he was uh, prepping horses over there with uh, triple headers. Uh, but he would take uh, he would take these horses all the way down past 210 and the triple miles down into 205 sometimes 202, um, and he would race and win over there. And then every year he would send about 25 horses over to Mike Gagliardi over at uh, uh, the Meadowlands. And um, when I heard about this, uh, I looked at what happened after Mike Gagliardi got the horses and what happened was that the horses continued to improve under Mike Gagliardi. In other words, they went faster and faster. They got sharper and sharper and started at 158 and ended up at 154 racing at the Meadowlands. Now, and that's going from an interval training process to a conventional training process where probably Mike never did anything faster than 205 in a training mile with him. And the races, though, were high-speed races at the Meadowlands. They've got a big mile track, and the Meadowlands is probably the one single factor that has created all these uh, real fast miles uh, because all the fast horses get together, big purses and a big mile track, and all the fast horses get together and knock each other's brains out, and you get 152s and 151s, and a two-minute mile is useless there. Um, so they're racing fast, and because they're racing fast, uh, they are getting faster. Now, the problem with horses that I had trained prior to this time uh, was that if I didn't keep up heavy-duty interval training with the horses, they would go backwards. If I turned them, let's say, over to a conventional trainer, and I had them in 156, they'd go back to 158, and then they'd go into a company that they couldn't beat, get sucked along, and bow a tendon going in 158. Even after they had done 156, bang, 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 three or four races in a row, they get sold, they go to somebody else, uh, they back up. Uh, John McMullen's horses didn't back up. Uh, with Mike Gagliardi doing a conventional training process, uh, they went on. They got better and better. And seeing that and coming back home and thinking about it and then going to a couple exercise physiology conferences, uh, uh, I started to learn the difference between tissue changes in muscle cells. Remember I was talking uh, on the last tape about uh, mitochondria as being a tissue change where glycogen 
packing in a muscle cell is a chemical change. In other words, uh, if you want to pump up a muscle with glycogen, you exercise it hard and then you feed a whole lot of potatoes and uh, the muscle pumps up and fuels up with glycogen within two or three days. But building mitochondria and changing fast twitch muscle cells to fast twitch high oxidative muscle cells and also building all that plumbing that supplies the oxygen to those uh, now highly oxidative uh, fast twitch muscle cells uh, takes time, months, takes maybe three months to, uh, to really do a, a good job of cardiovascular uh, conditioning. So when we're going through those three times one mile at slower rates of speed uh, and that are not race-specific works, we're putting in this long-lasting capability for improvement. Uh, we're putting in the tissues that can then further respond later on to uh, higher and higher rates of speed and more and more stressful situations. We're building the ability to benefit from conditioning and from racing further on. If we don't do that, then we get a kind of a shallow, easy come, easy go horse. If we go right straight to half miles and go zip, 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 as many times as they can go, uh, we get a fast uh, horse with a sustainable mile that really doesn't have m much more that he can do. He can't go too much further. And if you don't keep on the pressure, and sometimes it's difficult to keep on the pressure because stuff happens. I mean, sometimes you get an ankle starting, you get some suspensory starting, uh, his feet get sore, uh, he wants to tie up because you gave him a day off. Uh, a hundred things can start to go wrong that starts making you pull back your works and start looking carefully for the right kinds of races for this animal because he can't deliver too tough a workout or a race. And as soon as we start babying him, as soon as we start pulling back with the way I approached uh, interval training before with a shallow high speed prep of half miles and not taking those miles down much past 218, 216, the triple headers, uh, the horse goes backwards. As soon as you, as you pull back, he goes back. Uh, easy come, easy go. Use it or lose it. That's, that's the, uh, the immediate result of a shallow uh, race-specific preparation. Again, it's this big funnel. Uh, if you don't do this stuff, and if you don't do this stuff, and concentrate on this stuff, then you're going to get a lot of this stuff, which is going to be quick to come. It's all muscle fuel. It's all chemical. It's all uh, easily built neurotransmitters. They, cut, they hop up in five days. You do some work today, five days later you see the results in terms of alacrity of muscle contractions. Neurotransmitters spin up quick. Mitochondria don't spin up quick, and mitochondria is half of this game. Mitochondria um, <laughs> it sounds like a stupid word uh, to be using, but oxidative capacity in fast twitch muscle cells it is what allows you to sustain maximal effort for two minutes. Uh, they have to be built in, and they have to be built in up here. If they're not built in up here, you get down here to these high lactic acid levels, and you pump that lactate to the roof, and it gets out of control, and it actually destroys mitochondria. So you actually are going backwards. Uh, you get faster and faster and shorter and shorter until pretty soon you got a guy that can scream for a half mile and can't take another step after a half mile. So that we go from three times a mile to four times three quarters. Um, and, and the four times three quarters is, is really where the shit hits the fan, basically. Uh, those are tough workouts. Uh, sprint workouts uh, are easier to recover from than fuel depleting uh, high lactate level uh, workouts. And when you do four times three quarters with seven minutes in between, with a 10 second spread between the slowest and fastest, let's say uh, 145, 135 fastest, 145, 142, uh, 137, 135, something like that. That's a tough workout, and we typically take those workouts down as far as the horse wants to go before he flattens out, uh, plateaus out. Uh, plateauing uh, means that uh, 
you do two or three workouts in a row, and the best you can get out of this horse is uh, a 133 fastest of four. It's usually the fourth one. We don't look for that curve in three quarters. Again, the three quarter is longer than a half. Uh, that last quarter of a mile there uh, can do damage to the horse, so we're not looking to go past uh, our threshold a little bit and get a, a fall off. Any time in a three-quarter mile workout, we see the horse coming back at all, the workout's over before the three-quarter that, that we're on is finished. We just shut it down. But generally, again, uh, if you judiciously plan these workouts, what will happen is uh, you'll know you can do a 145 to a 135. Later on, you'll know you can do a 143 to a 133. Uh, but then you might find that you try, uh, you, you drop down to the next thing. You, again, you're slicing it finer and finer, uh, and the next workout after that 143, 133 might be starting at 141 or 142 and targeting for hopefully a 132 or maybe a 131. And what you get is you go 142 down and you get to 133 and that's as fast as he wants to go on that uh, on that fourth heat. And so you uh, give him an extra day of uh, light jogging bet between that workout and the next workout and try to make him pump into it uh, and try to crack that 133. Uh, again, you're not pushing him, you're not driving him, you're letting him roll the way he wants to with, a, with encouragement. No suck a long horse next to him or anything like that. He's by himself. But, and we'll talk about this by himself a little later, uh, but you're not whipping them. You're not driving them into a trying to drive into a 132. You don't get mad at them for and think that he's uh, uh, cheating on you or anything like that. You because he will go uh, as fast as he's capable of safely going. Uh, generally, horses tend to take care of themselves. On the other hand, they will die for you if you ask them to. And in, in today's workout, if you want to kill a horse, all you got to do is ask, and he'll he'll kill himself. Just pop that whip and drive him into it, and he'll die, okay? So he'll obey, uh, but we don't want him to obey. We want him to do what he can live with. And so he may flatten out at 133, and especially with babies, this can happen. Uh, and what you've got there is a 205 mile. You've got a, a 133 three quarter is on the way to a 205 or a 206 uh, mile, and that's all you've got. Uh, three quarters predicts it uh, on the way to. For example, a 130 three quarter fastest to four says you've got a two minute horse. A 131 says you've got a 201, 202 horse uh, at that point. So at a 133, you got a 205, 206 horse. You can qualify him, but he's not as fully trained as he possibly can be until you've gone through half miles and still plateau out at, let's say, 101 and uh, or 102, 103, that's a 205 horse, in, in a six-half or five-half workout. So when he plateaus out for a little while, then you go to the next step. And you would do this with the miles, too. If you're up at uh, 218, you drop to 216, you drop to 215, then you get another 215, then you get another 215. We're talking about separate work days, three or four days apart. <clears throat> but the fastest of the miles, all you can drag out of this guy is a 215. Uh, it's time to shift to a different mode of exercise, and that different mode would be multiple three-quarters. Uh, doesn't have to be, but uh, that's that's what I'm telling you because that's what I know how to do. Uh, there are things that, that I haven't tried. Um, so anytime you get a plateau, you go, go to the next step down, shorter and faster. Okay, again, the funnel. Uh, you flatten out. Well... Uh, going that far, he can't go any faster. So we shorten the distance and see if he can go faster. And generally it happens that you get a breakthrough and his legs start moving faster because they're not as tired on that third or fourth heat. They're not as tired as they were when they were going an extra quarter mile. So he does almost automatically go faster and you start crossing that, uh, that two-minute barrier. Uh, and usually we like to see six halves in these workouts. Uh, the reason for that is, with the half-mile workouts, is because uh, we're getting close to racing, and what we want to do is be able to taper back to four halves as a maintenance 
four or five halves as, as a maintenance workout between races. If we don't have anything to taper back to, uh, then we just got to go on with what we've what we've been doing. Uh, because you go three halves and you, you're not doing anything. Uh, at that point, you're making a little bubble on the lactic, lactic acid chart and there's no conditioning effect whatsoever. You might as well just uh, jog them or leaving them in the barn. You're not doing anything with three half miles, Expect, except maybe making them speed crazy. Uh, uh, let's talk about this company and the mental aspects and all this. Certainly, your racehorse has to learn to race beside, behind, and in front of other horses. Uh, otherwise, he's green, and he uh, it takes you months to get him uh, stabilized and, and racing like a smart, professional racehorse. But uh, a lot of this can be done in jog work on days that we're not doing these heavy-duty uh, interval training sessions. Uh, that's not to say that we don't occasionally uh, work horses side by side in interval training things, but not frequently because uh, one or the other of the horses gets sucked along too fast. And while he feels great and looks great and wants to win and gets real charged up, he cracks a knee or he chips an ankle or he bows a tendon. Uh, suck alongs in racing or in training are not real smart. Um, uh, you can do uh, uh, multiple horse works in the first couple heats of an interval exercise, but when you get down to those halves that are going to determine who's who and uh, where he is as a racehorse, or the last three quarter, or the third mile of three, um, best that they that they be separated at that point. You can do all sorts of other things at the slower rates of speed, but uh, when you get down to the crunch on interval training, uh, you re and it's it's smart with conventional training too. You don't want to go out and get your horse sucked along by some other like a good trotter. Let's say you got a real nice trotter, but he's he's uh, kicking his shins once in a while, going trying to make those turns. Uh, and you may think he's cheating, or he may be trying to miss himself. He may be trying to sidestep or stretch that uh, outside leg out. He may be doing a lot of things that you're not even aware of, but when you put him up against a faster horse and try to suck him into a, a 212, uh, you're begging for a big mistake to be made by his feet, and you're begging for him to, to hurt himself. So while the mental aspect of it has to be conditioned in just like the physical aspect of it, uh, you've uh, got to be very careful with uh, interval workouts that you don't suck a horse along. Uh, basically, the only safety value, valve you've ha you have is the horse telling you, coming back to you saying, hey, uh, that's about all I can take. Because for the most part, the horses are going to be enthusiastic about doing this work. And when they say no, believe them. Always believe them. Uh, Saying no can be coming back. Saying no can be running, taking a break. Uh, and again, taking a break is just as bad in uh, uh, conventional training as it is in uh, interval training. When a horse breaks, there's something the matter. It's not because he's stupid. It's not because he's emotional. It's not because of uh, any kind of thing other than he pinches. Uh, something's hurting. His hobbles aren't hung right, his shoes aren't right, his, he's kicking himself. Whatever the reason, this horse runs, breaks out of his gait because he's uncomfortable, because he's physically uncomfortable, not mentally, physically uncomfortable. And you better solve the problem. And it might be just too much speed, but it could be a hock, it could be a knee, it could be any uh, shoeing that's, that's bad or a shoe that's come off or a shoe that's twisted under her feet and his foot and trying to uh, crack his uh, coffin bone. Uh, it can be a lot of things, but it's physical. It's a physical problem. He hurts. And believe him. Just believe him. That's, that's, the, that's the truth. Uh, and the funny thing is, you believe him when they tell you no, you don't believe them when they tell you yes. Uh, and this this is more into the thoroughbred game than it is in the standardbred. Thoroughbreds are a little bit more vol volatile because you don't have 
the leverage that you can lean back on that bike and put your feet in the stirrups and really stop this guy from going too fast. And a thoroughbred, if a thoroughbred wants to run away with a 110-pound rider on his back or a 125-pound rider on his back, uh, he can do it. He can get away. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> uh, a lot of workouts with thoroughbreds, uh, the rider will come back and say, uh, uh, you, t you tell him to go a mile in two minutes, and he delivers a mile at 140, and you ask him, what the hell were you doing? Well, he got away. Uh, he ran away. Uh, I couldn't hold him. Uh, this is an excuse that's heard a uh, hundred times a day at the thoroughbred racetrack. Uh, and of course, when a horse runs away, uh, if he's not crippled on that day, then he'll be crippled three days later. Uh, so our philosophy with thoroughbreds is, hey, when they feel good, don't trust them because uh, they tend to do more with themselves than they can actually stand. Uh, again, muscle cells fuel quickly. Uh, thoroughbred uh, trainers in general don't do any work with their horses, uh, so, and so they get no structural uh, conditioning whatsoever. They do no warm-ups. Uh, it's all uh, little quarter miles, and once in a while a horse will, will run away for a whole mile and bow, a t bow both front tendons. More often than not, you'll see a double bow uh, on a thoroughbred that goes too far, too fast, too soon. We don't have that kind of a, a, pr a problem in standard bridge very much, but when you get a breakthrough workout, and there are these workouts that are breakthrough workouts where you've been flattened out. Let's say you're in half miles and you're hitting 101, 101, 101, uh, two or three weeks in a row, five five workouts. You can't crack that, and you're saying, Jesus, I don't want a 202 racehorse. I mean, they're, they're worth $2,500. I want a 158 or a 156 or a 154. How am I going to get this colt, this baby, or whatever it is, through this... Uh, uh, 202 barrier uh, and, you, and the answer is you keep honing and you try different things you try four halves one day try eight halves a different uh, time you, you mix and match you try to get uh, a workout that works but one day you're going to have a breakthrough workout you're going to have a pair of 58s wham uh, you'll go from a pair of 101s to a pair of 59s pair of 58s or a 58 and a 59 from one workout to the next and you'll be astonished you'll be flabbergasted that this that this could this horse really can do this and sometimes on pacers it's because they learn to roll their bodies properly on trotters they finally figure out how the damn feet are supposed to work uh, whatever it is there will be a breakthrough workout and it's mostly neuromuscular coordination that's, that's doing that um, and when that happens, you've suddenly got a better horse. Now, right then is not the time to go for more. Wow, he's, oh, he's, you should see him now. He's really improving. Hey, forget it. He gave you a big, big workout. It's time to give him extra days of just jogging. It's time to go to a slower workout next time. Don't test it right now because that extra speed that he delivered, uh, whether you know it or not, and whether he knows it or not, was a shock to his body. Suddenly, uh, there's an extra 2,000 pounds of concussion on those cannon bones or in those knee joints. Uh, there's an extra hundredth of a second worth of speed made up in a stride, a, a hundredth of a second quicker breakover, whatever. The, the mechanics have changed significantly with a two second or three second difference on a mile down at those kinds of speeds lots of things are changing in a big way lactic acid for example is uh, experiencing uh, a, a rapid change in response all of these things mean that when you get a super workout from a horse especially a baby but from any horse thank him for it uh, don't start believing that he's godzilla thank him for it, back up a little bit, give him an extra day of just jogging, um, and then sneak back up on that workout and see if he really loves to do it again. If he does, fine. You may find out, though, three days after that brilliant workout that you've got a little bit of a problem to deal with, a little bit of a wind puff, a little bit of a thick tendon, uh, maybe some sore feet, maybe uh, there's a lameness that you came in recognize but you know that he's off and uh, you can't do with any, do anything with him for a while um, be careful after good solid workouts okay we've talked 
some about interval training. We'll probably get back to parts of it later on. But uh, let's talk about other kinds of exercise that are uh, good and appropriate uh, types of exercise for different situations. Um, babies with stupid legs <clears throat> need to learn to use their legs uh, for speed, and they have to they have to learn it. Uh, gradually, of course, and carefully, but you're going to find that uh, some horses just don't know, just can't learn to deliver a good stride, especially the kind of stride that we were looking at uh, yesterday in, um, or the first tape uh, with that positive dissociation. Basically, uh, when a, uh, a pacer or a trotter accelerates, uh, they tuck their butt and reach their rear end up as far in front of the girth as they can get it, and they get their back end out of the way. Uh, but some horses just like to shuffle along, and you can jog four-minute miles with them for years, and they'll never, ever learn how to move their damn legs uh, in the way that is an acceleration and really grab that ground from behind. They just, they don't learn to steer from their butt. <clears throat> and that's too bad because if they go too many miles at uh, the wrong kind of stride, then they're hell to break out of it. Back at the turn of the century, there was a, a fellow named Leland Stanford that figured out uh, what they call the Palo Alto system. He did it in California. That's Palo Alto is where Stanford University is. This guy was a pretty wealthy fellow. He could do what he wanted with his horses. <clears throat> and they called it the Palo Alto, Alto system. And what they did was um, what in, uh, now some people call what they did interval training. It's not interval training. It's actually uh, fartlek training that came from uh, uh, English and Australian uh, human coaches, and basically what it, fartlek means speed play. Actually, Swedish is, is where it really originated. That's what the, where the word originated. Speed play, fast, back up, fast, back up, fast, back up. Brushing is what uh, we would call it now. Now, brushing is good, taken in uh, in context, in other words, where your horse is and not going so much faster that you suddenly, again, increase the pounds of concussion per stride by two or three thousand pounds, uh, then you're going to crack a bone. You're going to uh, get bucked shins, believe it or not, in standard bread. People don't think that standard breads buck their shins. Hey, they buck their shins. And if you don't believe it, you haven't been in the business long enough. They do buck their shins, and babies especially, and that comes from too rapid an increase in concussion, and concussion equals speed, so too fast an increase in speed. However, if you've got a horse jogging in 430, then uh, an increase in speed that he can tolerate uh, is typically a four-minute rate. If he's jogging in three minutes, then a piece of speed that he can tolerate is at least a, a 245 rate for a quarter mile, let's say, down the straightaway. Or if you want them to learn to accelerate through turns, then through the turns, and then back off on the straights. And uh, what you do with your watch as you're as you're doing accelerations, you look at your total mile to to estimate where you are in terms of overall stress and fatigue on this horse. In other words, if he's doing four-minute miles, you don't want to start accelerating straightaways and end up with three-minute miles at the same distance that he was going before. Uh, you're going to uh, hurt him. Okay, so you can't do that. But uh, if you take very good care to slow them way down in the off portions of this jogging and then really let them rip uh, and really let them rip again doesn't mean going two-minute rate of speed with a three-minute horse. It means going a 230 rate of speed maybe for a quarter of a mile down that straightaway and then pulling them way back. What he does, and I don't know if he does this mentally, or if he does it just because the, the gate is causing him to do that, but he starts learning to tuck his butt. Okay, He starts learning to reach with his rear end. And uh, pretty soon, uh, he he's reaching with his rear end when he's jogging a four-minute rate. In other words, uh, may, I like to think that in, the, in this 
horse's mind, he's thinking, well, this idiot, every little bit, he asked me for some speed, and I have to get my legs all tangled up and get them stretched out, and sometimes I knock myself, and uh, uh, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to get into this configuration of uh, pacing or trotting that when he asks for this speed, I don't have to untangle my legs and go for that speed. Instead, all I have to do is put some power to the muscles and I can get it going. And so what you end up with is a horse that over a period, it takes about three workouts like this, uh, where the horse uh, automatically is reaching with every stride if he's going four minutes or if he's going two minutes or the pacer is rolling and he's got the roll whether he's going at four minutes or two minutes. Uh, the horse takes on the stride that you know you're going to ask for and probably does it so that he doesn't get his legs tangled up trying to accelerate to that speed. Instead he just puts the power to it and wham he's there. And uh, this is real good for babies learning to teach their legs how, how to move. It's practice that is not injurious, does not build a whole lot of fatigue. Again, if you really slow down on those off, I mean, you know, if, you can't, if you're on a half-mile track and you're shooting straights, you almost have to come to a, a five-minute jog around the turns. Uh, because there's not that much time between one straightaway and the other. And again, we're talking eighths of a mile or quarters of a mile. We're not talking any longer than that. Uh, so on a half-mile track, it might be good to just do one straightaway, go around the whole track at a regular jog, and do the next straight, the, the, the same straightaway again, and then go all the way around the track and do the same straightaway again, rather than going this straightaway, and then that straightaway, and then this straightaway. Uh, you may not have enough time to slow the horse down to... Uh, a slow enough jog that the average mile is no faster than uh, than you want it to be. Again, four minutes can do 330s, uh, but not. I wouldn't test uh, three minute miles on a, on a, on a four minute horse that's been doing four minutes uh, pretty regularly. Um, <clears throat> plain jog miles. Uh, are good in quantity. Now again, I told you uh, in the other tape that uh, Australian trainers and New Zealand trainers often do 18 to 20 miles with a horse. Now, they don't do it like we do. They have um, two or three or four horses going at once. Sometimes the guys are just in jog carts with reins to the horses on either side of them. Two horses this side, two horses that side, and one horse pulling them. Or they have these vehicles uh, that have little stalls in them, much like uh, thoroughbred starting gates uh, that the horses clipped in, and they drive a truck around with six horses jogging these miles. Um, and this kind of work is good for the structures. We already know that. But uh, here's another concept that I just learned uh, recently from a, a human exercise consultant that works with Olympic athletes, uh, especially cyclers. And uh, I had been talking to him. I was saying, you know, we, we do these uh, high-intensity exercises at the very tail end of our uh, training process uh, so that we can uh, cause fast twitch muscle cells to become activated uh, and to uh, experience lactate levels that are high so that they can grow themselves some mitochondria and deal with this uh, uh, lactic acid problem. Uh, and he said, uh, well, that's, that's well and good. You have to be very, very careful at those high speeds. You don't go too high a lactate level or you actually destroy those uh, mitochondria. And he said, uh, but, there, you know, there's another way. And I said, um, no, I, I, I didn't know there's another way. Tell me another way to activate fast twitch muscle cells. And he says, well, you exhaust slow twitch muscle cells. And uh, that's interesting because that's true. If uh, you work enough miles slow twitch muscle cells become depleted of fuel and stop firing and the only muscle cells left to fire are fast twitch muscle cells. Now uh, he was explaining to me that uh, that's the way he develops 
power, firepower in his cyclers is to get them to exercise for a long enough period of time that they actually run out of slow twitch muscle cells to fire and then are firing fast twitch muscle cells. And uh, once they get to that place, then he lets them keep on going until their heart rates go up just far enough and then uh, he stops them because that heart rate rising also parallels the lactic acid rising and he, he doesn't want a whole lot of lactic acid in there uh, floating around damaging the mitochondria that he's already built, so he'll stop them at a certain point. Uh, his elite cyclers uh, require four hours worth of steady, hard exercise at 190 or 100, well, the equivalent of a horse 190 would be 160 uh, heart rate four hours before they reach the point at which the uh, the heart rate starts to rise. In other words, the, the lactic acid is building. Uh, four hours uh, of pretty good intensity. That's the equivalent. A human 160 heart rate is the equivalent of at least a three-minute mile in a, in a relatively unfit standard bread or somewhere around 230 uh, with... Uh, a, a pretty fit uh, standard bread, and it's the equivalent of a standard bread's 190 heart rate. So that's cooking right along for four hours. Now these are, of course, athletes that uh, work eight hours a day. I mean, exercise eight hours a day every day uh, to become Olympic level fit athletes. So that's not unusual to them, but it's sure uh, to get to take a horse to, uh, to that point. Uh, would take the same number of years, or not maybe not all the years, but you remember these kids that are going to the athletes at 22, 23, and 24 years of age started when they were 10 and have been conditioning themselves through uh, 8, 9, 10, 12 years of uh, uh, grade school, junior high, high school, college uh, athletic programs. They've been getting fitter and fitter and tougher and tougher all the way through that process. We do it in, well, thoroughbred guys do it in 60 days, okay? Uh, standard bred guys are smarter. Uh, they'll take six to nine months uh, to try to make a, a horse fit. So to get a horse to go far enough to suck down those slow twitch muscle cells and, and trigger fast twitch mu muscle cells going slow takes some significant miles, and I'd say that your Australians and your New Zealanders are probably getting some of that job done. I don't think that six miles a day here is getting the job done. If you're doing four miles or less and you're not doing it every day, really, you're not really conditioning an athlete. You're, you're playing around. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, what I've seen going to the racetracks dealing with uh, standard bred guys is they were a hell of a lot smarter 10 years ago than they are now, in general. I'm not talking about you, <laughs> uh, but I'm talking about the average standard bred trainer. He's lazier, he's stupider uh, than they used to be. I mean, I. I spent time with Harold Dancer and Ronnie Dancer and uh, a hundred good trainers, and the the best of them are old guys. Now there's there are some uh, that aren't. Ernie Gaskin is a brilliant trainer. Uh, Pelling out of uh, Australia, racing at the Meadowlands, is a brilliant trainer. Uh, not that they use my stuff. Uh, uh, they're just damn good horsemen, and they are—they are out there, young. But in general, the young guys that I'm seeing, in general, um, never read the, the care and training. Uh, never sat down next to a good horseman who said, "Hey, sit at this bench." You ask him questions. I, I used to ask Curly Smart. I used to say, "What's it all about, Alfie?" And <clears throat> You know, uh, he'd be sitting on the bench and he'd be watching the horses go by and he said, uh, that one's off in the left front. I said, you know, how, how can you see that? Uh, I can't see that that horse is off. Uh, how do you know? And he said, look, uh, the solution to learning about horses is watching them move. You're going to see horses that are moving right and you're going to see horses that are moving wrong. 
and you can get all, all this scientific gadgetry and stuff and try to figure it out, but the way to see it is to watch. And if you watch and watch and watch and watch, one day that picture is in your mind, and you can see right from wrong. You can see left front is healthy, left front is unhealthy. And uh, I didn't believe him to start with. I thought this is more hocus pocus uh, um, horse lore. Uh, but that was my fault. Uh, four or five years into it, I began to, get, and I wasn't looking for it, so it took me a damn long time to develop. I began to get the eye or the picture of a nice moving trotter, and they were more difficult than a nice moving pacer. But you begin to get this picture in your mind of what's right and what's wrong about a horse and then back at the stall you get the same thing you can you can look in a horse's eye you can uh, they you know the traders say that these horses talk to you and the truth is they do talk to you uh, they'll tell you when they're right and they'll tell you when they're wrong and you just automatically have to believe them so there's a couple of ways, you know. I've got I, I've met a uh, standard bred trainer in California who uh, trains his standard bred specifically up and down the sand dunes with a jog cart, up and down the sand dunes on a California beach, and wins and has hard-legged horses that just go out and beat the living daylights out of them all. And he does interval training uphill. Uh, when I was down in Florida uh, one year, I was watching the Swedes come in. This was early. This is back in 1983, uh, 82. Uh, these guys were coming in and uh, everybody was laughing at them. They had these big tractor tires that they were pulling behind their jog carts. And uh, everybody was laughing. Now, I, was, I wasn't laughing because I was one of these crazy people too. I was out doing weird things. I had weighted jog bikes uh, with Volkswagen wheels on them. And uh, this looked like a real good idea to me with their babies. They're pulling extra weight. Now, uh, how do you build fast twitch muscle cells or high energy or firepower or strength going slow with a baby because you have to go slow with a baby because the cartilage pads aren't developed yet and they're not tough enough to take the speed and the pounding of speed. Well, you do it by weightlifting. You do it by resistance exercise. Going uphill is resistance exercise. Pulling something behind the jog cart is resistance exercise. You can go three minutes and get a two minute lick uh, resistance uh, going and you uh, you'll build all that lactate and you'll get those damn uh, uh, bowed tendons if you don't watch out. But if you want to get more firepower built into a baby when his muscle cells are the most pliable, the most plastic, they can change from slow twitch to fast twitch early in their life. Uh, if you want to get that job done, uh, then that's the way to do it with uh, resistance exercise as opposed to high speed exercise that'll cripple the, the babies. So there's a, a piece of innovation, and, the, and of course the Swedes, all of this good science on interval training came from Sweden. Uh, their uh, racetracks are uh, subsidized the science, the equine science in the country. There's a direct pullout from racetrack take that goes into, it's, a, it's kind of a socialist country, so the government runs everything and the government pays the science scientists to do good science on their racehorses. Back in 1976, the first interval training papers started coming out of Sweden. Over here, nobody ever heard of interval training in the uh, in the horse horse racing business, and those professors work very closely with a horseman on the racetrack, doing experiments, trying to get this to happen better, that to happen better, get the nutrition programs better, uh, and out of all that comes these guys that invade us. Thank God they don't train pacers because they own pacing too. Right now, the Swedes and the Norwegians and the Scandinavian folks own U.S. trotting. They just came in and invaded and took us uh, took us over. Uh, they like trotters. If they were if they were training pacers, the way they, they train their trotters, uh, they'd be beating us. Nobody's laughing now at the Swedes. They're heroes. Uh, all the big boys, all the big money uh, that used to be sending uh, real fancy horses to other guys who were laughing at these Swedes are not sending those fancy horses to those laughers anymore. They're sending them to the Swedes. Okay? Why? Because they proved that they knew what the hell they were doing. And they are superb 
horseman. Soren Nordin is a superb horseman, and that means all of the non-scientific things that he knows. I mean, he can read a horse's mind. Uh, he can read a horse's legs. Uh, there are those kinds out there. There's a bunch of them out there, but the vast majority of our standard bread trainers are getting worse and they have no thought of innovation and they try to keep these poor cripples together after they cripple them they don't realize that if they cripple them they're not going to be worth very much they go ahead and cripple them and then they try to keep patching them up and cussing them out and saying how come you blew that suspensory you son of a bitch you know but they're not thinking of prevention they're not thinking of preserve they're thinking hey it's Thursday and uh, we've got matinee races and I think I'll just drop this guy and see what he can do Okay, that's the right, I mean, and they have no idea of exercise science, of, of what it takes to condition an athlete. These guys are ex-cab drivers, you know. You can't expect them to know it, but uh, you would expect, and then when somebody next to them is doing something different than they do, or than everybody else on the racetrack does, if they have, if they encounter an innovator, why, it's like the devil. The devil incarnate. This guy, look at this. He's, he's six miles a day. Hey, what are you doing? Trying to make me look bad? You're doing six. I'm doing four. What's this? Three times triple headers? Are you at six half miles? Are you trying to kill your head? Hey, call the stewards. Let's get to the, He's trying to kill these horses. You know, and then those horses go out and kick the living hell out of these poorly conditioned horses. And then they get mad about that. And then they start accusing you of drugs. And they start even more, you know. Uh, the racetrack environment was bad enough 10 years ago. It's getting worse and worse and worse. There's more drugs, there's more uh, hustles and uh, stuff like that than there ever was back then. I mean, Curly Smart was an honest man. Stanley Dancer is an honest man. Uh, there aren't that many anymore. There aren't that many anymore. Now, you're probably honest. And I'm probably honest um, but there have been times for me when here we got a $75,000 race and here's a horse that's showing something and the question is do you hit him with a corticosteroid do you hit him with butte do you do something to to him to keep him together for Saturday hoping crossing your fingers that he doesn't fall down and kill the driver or kill the rider or crash everybody else's horse, kill himself. There have been times when I have advised people to go ahead and run. And now, generally, it wasn't. It was. I had a pretty good idea what the problems were and knew that the horse probably would not fall down. But I've always thought that that was kind of uh, immoral. Uh, I mean, these these beasts will die for us. Okay, you know. <laughs> Uh, why make them do it? Still, there are occasions when, uh, because of the kind of a game this is, and, be, and despite the fact that we're dealing with living uh, flesh and blood, uh, we make these compromises, we make these decisions that, uh, that, that can make us feel uh, guilty afterwards. And I've done it, uh, I, and I've made stupid blunders uh, in training. <laughs> I mean, if you're a professional, it means that you've made 3,000 mistakes. If you haven't made your 3,000 mistakes, you're not a professional yet, okay? <laughs> That's the definition of experience. That's the definition of expertise. 3,000 mistakes. And I've, I've made my 3,000 mistakes. I can remember most of them. I can remember vividly because they keep staring me in the face saying, you remember what you did to that nice trotting colt, you dumbass? Um, so these tapes really are part of me trying to help you avoid some of the stupid things that I've done and maybe encourage you to innovate and avoid getting off track with the stupid things that other people are going to tell you that you should be doing uh, to your horses. I hope it helps. Uh, and again, my voice is just one voice among many. You can decide whether this tape is worth the money you paid for it, whether my advice is uh, worth following, or whether the knowledge imparted it is useful or not uh, to you.
uh, and there's a full refund. If, if this is not uh, what you're looking for, then uh, you get your money back. Uh, there's never going to be any problem with that. So if this tape offends you, if you think you're one of the dummies that I'm talking about, then send it back for a full refund, and my guys will kick your ass next time we're at the racetrack. Because this stuff does work. <laughs> Good exercise physiology applied to the racehorse works, uh, and it works to the tune of two to four seconds on the average standard bread. The very best that they can be trained, you can improve them two to four seconds further from that with a good conditioning program. We've done it with horses that have been trained and have won stakes, and we have improved them by four seconds very quickly. You know, not overnight, but three months later, four months later, wham, we're crossing two minutes, and then wham, we're down into 156, 157, uh, with a horse that was sitting at Yonkers, 201, 201, 201, and doing pretty good uh, at 201. He was making some money, but at 156, he won the open pace, and that wasn't that many months later. And it was after a rather quick introduction to uh, a six-half-mile interval training regime so it works what I'm telling you it will make you money and that's the idea of this <laughs> of the price of this tape is hey uh, it'll make you money there's going to be ideas in this tape throughout that one of them just using one of them is going to make you money enough money to pay for all these tapes and another dozen sets of tapes so that's what I th that's what I think now We'll go from there, and you can decide what uh, what you think, and what you think is is fine with me. Okay, enough uh, preaching, and let's get back to training modalities, different kinds of training modalities. Um, recently, uh, in the last five years or so, th has been the advent of the high-speed treadmill, and we've used it on thoroughbreds and on some standard breads, but mostly with thoroughbreds uh, uh, because of the cost of the rider. You know, seven dollars one time around the track is is pretty serious money after a while. And uh, so we've been experimenting with high-speed treadmills, and we found out that uh, and these are treadmills that can take a, a thoroughbred galloping down to uh, about a 145 mile. That's cooking. I mean, when you see a horse doing that right next to you, standing still and just screaming at a 145 mile, you know you're seeing some firepower happening right before your very eyes. And uh, high-speed treadmills are uh, wonderful devices, and there are some now. The Sato Junior or the Sato Two is uh, priced at $25,000, which is is pretty damn cheap for the kind of device it is, and it's a very effective device and seems to be holding together. They've had some belt problems and some parts problems, but uh, uh, the people that I know that own them uh, are getting them fixed, and uh, they're probably more uh, hassle than a, than a salesman would have you think, but they are very, very useful devices, and they pay for themselves very, very quickly, especially with thoroughbreds. And the nice thing about treadmills is you can get resistance exercise by tilting them up and, and making the horse uh, go on an incline. Uh, you don't have to go quite as fast to get the same uh, level of uh, muscle fuel and lactic acid stress on them. Uh, you can videotape their stride uh, from the side or from the front. You can see how those feet are flying, and you can play around with the shoes all day long and get the damn things right. Uh, without having to get out on that jog cart and trying to catch a glimpse from the side or trying to look underneath the, the horse's legs to see how they're flying. You, ne you never see it accurately. There was a device out of Canada that actually mounted a camera underneath the jog bike, and you could look. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, on this tape, I'll show you some, uh, some of that footage. Um, but... Uh, videotaping with a good video camera that has a good slow motion to it, you can look at the way that foot flies through the air and see how it's landing and if it's landing perfectly or if it's out of balance. Uh, with a treadmill, you can sit there and film it all day long with a video camera, and you know videotapes you can use over and over and over again. So uh, with your babies, when they're, when they're first starting to train, you can very quickly determine whether their gates are correct or incorrect, and you can start fiddling around little by little. In other words, no surprises. Never surprise 
with more than two degrees up and down or too much of this or that or too aggressive a shoe or anything like that. Just little by little, check to see if you're going in the right direction. If you are, go a little bit more and a little bit more. We've got time. We've got plenty of time. These babies got time. We've got time. Uh, if we don't have time, you don't belong in the horse business. Um, anyway, the high-speed treadmill is a very useful uh, exercise mode, especially up in the north in the winter time. Uh, even in Canada, where uh, sometimes you just can't go out on the tracks because there's four or five feet of snow out there, or you have to go out on the ice and put spikes on their feet, which is not healthy for their hocks and for their ankles or for their knees. So, high speed treadmills is uh, a good exercise, uh, exercise mode. And they've done uh, treadmill work with pulleys and weights and all sorts of other kind of things to uh, to uh, make for resistant e resistance exercise on treadmills. Uh, real good exercise device. Now, if you do inconsistent exercise, in other words, six miles today, two miles tomorrow, no miles the next day, six miles the day after, one of the things that you're likely to uh, encounter is tying up in these horses. So tying up almost always in a racehorse that is pretty damn fit uh, is due to inconsistent day-to-day -day exercise. And that means that there may be a time when one of your horses needs seven days a week of significant uh, fuel drawdown. Um, I went to the uh, uh, equine scientific meeting over in uh, Sweden last year, and one of the research studies was showing that in tying up horses, fast twitch muscle cells had a funny kind of sugar in them that was almost like uh, rock candy sugar, hard, uh, and was not, quote, biodegradable. And they didn't know whether this was the, a coincidence or a cause, but in my experience, what I found is that the fitter the horse gets, the more it is necessary to draw down his fuel supply uh, every day uh, so that uh, the glycogen cycles through the horse. Um, and you have to feed this work. In other words, uh, if you're not, uh, your horse should never lose weight. Uh, from the time that he starts training, he should be gaining or staying the same. He should never lose weight. Horses don't get fat like you and me get. This is adipose tissue, okay? Uh, and I've probably got on my body uh, 20 pounds of adipose tissue. I used to have about 40 or 50 pounds of adip adipose tissue. Um, the fattest of horses carries maybe 25 or, or 30 pounds of adipose tissue on his body at, at any particular time. That's the horse that's been standing in his stall, the, the show horse that doesn't get out and do much at all. Uh, for the most part, there is no adipose tissue on horses that have been in training for any, any significant period of time. Now, you'll see their bellies tuck up. Uh, but that's a muscle that's tightening. Uh, same if I, if I sat and did a lot of sit-ups, then this muscle that's under this adipose tissue would tighten up and would suck in and uh, hold my guts in tighter, and it would look like I'm, I've lost weight. It won't be that I've lost weight. It'll be that uh, that muscle is tighter. And so when your belly, your horse's belly tucks up, that's not fat burning off. That's uh, a muscle getting fit. Um, if your horse does lose 100 pounds, and if you don't know how much he weighs, uh, so here's another, another problem. In Europe and all the other racing countries, everybody knows what their horse weighs. I mean, they don't look at it and say, yeah, he's about 1,000 pounds, looks like about 1,000 pounds to me. Um, they all know because they actually weigh their horses uh, frequently. Uh, um, the Pelling weighs his horses. Uh, there are trainers in this country that do weigh their horses, but they're few and far between because they don't realize what the significance of that is. If your horse loses 100 pounds, uh, let's say after three weeks of racing or whatever, uh, where does that 100 pound come? You know, he's got a total of 25 pounds maybe 
if he was fat as a pig to start with, of adipose tissue, fat tissue. Okay. So let's say he loses all that, and he, he sure as hell better not lose all that because he needs that fat for other things, for keeping his cells uh, alive. But let's say he loses that 25 pounds of adipose tissue. Then there's another 75 pounds that come off if he loses 100 pounds. Where, where the hell did that come from? It's not bone. Probably not bone. Well, it's muscle, and it's muscle glycogen those two things. If, if, if your horse runs out of fuel, glycogen, then he'll burn fat and he'll burn whatever available protein there is. And if he runs out of fat, he'll, he'll really start burning protein. And you can, you can tell when he's burning fat and protein because his breath gets metallic, he gets ketotic. Uh, and you can smell his breath and it smells horrible. If he's really burning it up like that, you can, you can tell. But, more often than not, that won't happen, and you'll still lose 100 pounds, and what, what you'll get is a sore horse, a real sore horse. Body sore, you touch him any place on his body, and he'll flinch because he's, he's muscle sore. He's, he's burning muscle tissue for fuel, uh, and he goes slower and slower, and you wonder if he's trying to cheat on you and stuff like that. And then he gets uh, anorexic. He won't eat. Why? Because he's too damn sore to eat. He doesn't want to eat. And you know, ever notice when horses get sore, they don't want to eat? Well, you suck that 100 pounds off them, and you get a horse that goes anorexic and uh, doesn't want to eat at all. And then you got months and months and months of turning this guy around. You've already got a month worth of turning around if he's lost that 100 pounds because that tissue is tissue. It doesn't come back like uh, chemicals do. So. The solution is to feed the exercise. The more work he does, the more feed he gets. And we've had uh, horses that uh, eat 25 pounds a day of uh, high-intensity rations. Uh, Doug Arthur, who trained Cam Fella and, and Justin Passing and uh, Mystery Skipper and a number of others, uh, feed straight shelled corn. There's not an oat in his barn. Okay, and uh, did that with all his horses. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there's a fellow out here, Dr. John McLean, who uh, races the hot dog ho horses uh, and, has, and wins every year, wins something, some kind of a championship with one of his horses out of uh, Indiana. Uh, he feeds uh, a mix that is almost all corn. He's, there's no oats. There is, and it's cracked corn. It's crushed corn. Um, and he feeds as much of it as the horse will eat in a day, and he feeds four times a day, and you have to feed more than three times a day if you're feeding, if you're really doing some heavy work with a horse, you have to pump the carbohydrates to them. Corn is the most intense source of carbohydrates. In other words, there's going to be a point at which you, you can't feed enough oats to deliver the carbohydrates necessary to uh, keep pumping up those muscles and making making for more sustainable speed in a race. Um, there's a new kind of oat called naked oats or penuda, P-E-N-N-U-D-A. Uh, seeds came out of the um, uh, University of Pennsylvania and now seed companies have them and some farmers in some places are starting to grow them. Uh, these oats have the same nutrient value uh, in terms of energy as corn, and they have a very high protein uh, content because they don't have any shell on the outside. It, what you see is what you get. In other words, uh, something like 40% of the, the, the regular oat is shell, which is useless. Uh, and if you want bulk, you don't feed uh, oat shells, you feed hay. Um, we, tr we try to keep our horses in uh, free choice hay, half alfalfa, half uh, grass hay all day long, and then pump the carbohydrates to them with uh, a balanced ration that is intense in carbohydrate and in protein. Uh, Carnation Super Horse is an example of that kind of a feed. Um, Omeline 300 is another example, a little bit short on protein there. Um, there's a product made by Vitaflex called Axel, uh, which has uh, an amino acid balance that helps a lot in terms of the right kinds of proteins uh, going into the horse. Uh, adding um, soybean meal is not 
the best way to get protein into the horse, and a lot of feed manufacturers are using soybean meal as their source of protein. Uh, it's missing lysine because uh, that's leached out in the bleaching process of the soybean meal. So that's not necessarily, uh, soybean meal is not the solution to getting protein. Milk, dried milk products are a good source of protein. Minimum 16% protein and high intensity feed. If you're feeding straight oats, straight normal oats, you're not going to be able to maintain any kind of a serious exercise uh, program with your horse. Uh, and you know the little things mean a lot. These little side things that uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, stuff that can go wrong, we'll do that later in the uh, uh, this series of tapes. Uh, little things, little tiny things, all the damn detail. I mean, you're dealing with a, a, a living organism that is affected by, and you are his jailer. Uh, you control everything that he sees, eats, tastes, and touch. I mean. You are his God, and uh, if you don't deliver all of the little details properly that a living organism, uh, this in this case a horse, needs, then he dies. Then he falls apart. Then he physically turns into a bowl of jelly. And, you know, if you want to be in this business to make a profit, you have to look at those details and supply them. And nutrition uh, is 20% of the game for sure. I mean, exercise is maybe 25% of the game. Breeding is maybe 25% of the game. Nutrition is 20% of the game. And then all of the things that can go wrong, hell, they're 100% of the game. I mean, you, uh, you, you put those damn toe grabs on, drop those... Uh, 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 angles down to 48, 47, and you bow two front tendons, it's over. I mean, that's 100%. It's all gone. This horse will never come back. He's useless. So little things mean a lot, and the one little thing that means, and, and the little parts of nutrition, you just can't go with what the guy, in fact, everything that your guys next door are doing, you look at what all of them are doing, just take the average thing that all of them are doing and figure that that's wrong figure that that's wrong. And then you look for the winners, that one guy out of uh, 30 who seems to consistently be pumping away and winning races, first starts. I mean, he doesn't have to race them into shape. Wham, they come out and they're ready. Watch what he does. He may not be doing what I'm telling you to do, but God damn it, he's right. <laughs> he's winning. He's winning the game. And you learn from those guys and don't learn from the guys that are next to you telling you, spend all their time telling you what the hell to do with every horse in your barn every minute of the day. They're going to be in your face telling you that you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, and I know uh, I was born knowing all this shit. Hey, look at his, how many cripples has he got in his barn? How many races is he winning? Is he making a million dollars? The guys that are making a million dollars don't have time to talk to you don't have time to worry about your business. They're, they're in a big business and they're making money and they don't want, they don't have the time. They would, I mean, you know, uh, Stanley Dancer and uh, Billy Houghton when he was live and uh, Delvin Miller, uh, Curly Smart, they were all perfectly happy to sit down and help you. I mean, how many hours do you want? Yeah, let's talk about it. They were all perfectly happy to, but they wouldn't go out of their way to come over to your barn and say, hey, stupid, uh, you got that hooked up wrong, or you're feeding the wrong stuff. You're feeding corn, are you crazy? You're feeding alfalfa, are you crazy? They, they wouldn't mind your business. They were quality people, our quality. Some of them are still alive, and they're quality people. Uh, guys that pay attention to your business for you are never going to make it because they're spending too much time doing the wrong things, looking at the wrong thing. So everything they do, do different than, than they do, and you'll be ahead of the game. Uh, we'll be back in a little while with, uh, with another tape.